Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us, as we have every week, Professor Satyajit Rath, and we're going to discuss what is happening with the COVID-19 pandemic, both in India and globally. Satyajit, we have been discussing this issue for quite some time now. But we are reaching a phase where we now have started to see vaccines at least reach a section of the people in different countries, of course. Some more in some certain countries, in some countries yet to even receive a single dose. So we are into a very differential situation over there. India, not so bad because it is indigenous vaccine capacity. But we are also seeing the second, third waves, as they are called, taking place, numbers rising. So it's clear that without large-scale vaccination, we cannot reduce the pandemic to any other disease uh, which is endemic in the world. So we are really in that situation. And there is no easy victory over the disease. That's, that's very clear at the moment. I'm going to take you through uh, my uh, some of our, our charts, the news click chart, just to show what is happening so we can discuss that with our viewers. If you see the chart now, what's happening in India, what's our COVID tracker chart that's there on news click. And if you do the, what we do normally, the log view of the chart, so you can have a look at the larger trend, then you tend to see now that there is Maharashtra, there is Punjab, there is Karnataka, Gujarat, Tamil Nadu, Madhya Pradesh six states which are rising relatively fast compared to what we have seen in the past. So we shouldn't think that this is just a small kink in the chart. It is essentially showing there is a trend that is now visible. And you will also see below it, which are the uh, not so colored lines, gray lines, you will see there are a number of states where the numbers are going up, but not so fast. I mean, not at this rate, but numbers are still going up. Kerala has been in the highlight for some time. It is a state which has a large number of cases still, but you can see the fall is there consistently now for a few weeks. If you look at these charts where we have a little more detail, then you will see certain other things that you can see that Chhattisgarh, for instance, is also there. Uh, West Bengal is there, Telangana is there. Numbers rising, but not too, when too high, a, not too steep a rise. But you look at the positivity ratio, how many uh, tests are being carried out and how many are proving to test positive. You will see again that in Maharashtra, it's, it used to be 7.5 per 100 tests. Now it's 15.5. And you will see similarly, for instance, Punjab also, so it was 1.5 a few, third, about four weeks back, it's 5.8 now. So all of this seem to indicate that we are seeing what is being called the second wave, you know, whatever waves you want to call it doesn't really mean much. And if we look at Maharashtra, what you also see that the cities are at least four cities. And you can see the urban areas near Mumbai, really, Thane, and you will also see certain other districts near Mumbai also getting affected. But you also have Pune, Nagpur, and lower down you have Bangalore, and Delhi. So again, the urban centers being the focus, but given Punjab, it's also true that it is spread in other areas. So Satyajit, is it clear that we have a numbers rising again? We may soon need to lock down already certain measures seem to be being taken. And therefore, without now vaccination reaching sections of the people, uh, you're not going to see this uh, easily controlled. It may still go down after a few months again, as it did the last time. But this is at least clear that the uh, so-called DST model, which had claimed victory by February, this is not really what's happening, that the epidemic is and will continue to burn into new sections of people. Um, absolutely. Um, let me add a couple of points of interest for the present situation. As you know, I'm reluctant to refer to it as a wave um, because the word implies that there is a certain uniformity and that it's going to recede. And neither of those is as comfortingly accurate uh, as all that. So um, what we are beginning to see 
is a growing uh, number of simultaneous outbreaks in more and more localities. There are two points that should be noted by all of us in this spread. Number one, six months ago, the bulk of this spread was in urban, hyper-crowded working class communities. Today, the major points of spread are characterized by two interesting properties. One, they have now spread and are coming up in much more urban middle-class localities. Secondly, these are not outbreaks that are reoccurring in the same locations that were most seriously affected six months ago. This is at least true of localities in, for example, Pune, Mumbai, and so on and so forth. So while on the other hand, it feel, on the one hand, it feels as though the same cities that were affected six months ago are being affected today, within the structure of the cities, the epidemic outbreaks have shifted location. What this says is two things. Number one, because they have shifted from hypercrowded to crowded localities, the rate of increase of spread is going to be a little slower, but because the localities are much larger, it might even end up being more sustained as a spread. Secondly, this is not contrary to what many people are uh, beginning to think, oh, these are variants of the virus that are causing reinfection. By and large, the patterns are not patterns as yet that are explained by reinfection. Similarly, they are not patterns that are as yet substantially affected by vaccinations, since India only has about 3% of its population vaccinated anyway. So that the fraction of the population being vaccinated is not going to make any material difference to the pattern of local outbreaks. So those are the issues that we should be keeping in mind. And of course, as you point out, the only way forward we have is a sustained campaign of monitoring the virus and of vaccinating against the virus in the large scale along with support for livelihoods and the economy. Sati, that brings me to another question. Do you think epidemiolo epidemiologically, there is an argument now to focus on vaccinating populations in centers where we are seeing the outbreaks rather than focus on general rules for all states, all sections, starting with the health workers, of course, health workers first everywhere. That is get taken for granted but above 60 population first and other population next, rather than switching tack and saying, okay, those areas which are seeing very large numbers as of now, and Maharashtra is really going up very quickly, that those really centers which where we see this outbreaks taking place, we should actually give them some amount of priority in the way we are vaccinating. It's, it's an extremely attractive model in, in in, in vacuum to say, oh, you have an outbreak here, let's just do vaccination there. The uncomfortable and messy reality is, do we have the kind of logistic supply chains for the vaccination campaign to, to expand them explosively? Um, keep in mind that what we are talking about is today's rates which are actually a reflection of transmission 10 days ago. So um, our, our picture of what's going on is always an after the fact picture. So as, as we plan vaccination uh, campaigns, even if we plan local intensive vaccination campaigns, the time gaps and what will happen to the growth of the, uh, the rate of spread locally it might well make uh, the gains really relatively small, number one. Number two, the other problem is given our limitations, we can only supply vaccines and put people in locations of this kind by withdrawing them from others. This denial 
is both going to be a perception problem and quite frankly, an actual problem. So, so I'm not sure that this uh, uh, solution, which many of my armchair friends are uh, um, offering with perfectly good intentions and with reasonable anxieties is actually that cleanly implementable. And, and, and I think that needs to be kept in mind. Attractive as an idea, but practically has all kinds of issues, one of which is trying to catch our own tail. So the chasing, and <laughs> when you chase what is the current rate of infection, you're really not chasing the current rate of infection, you're chasing something that's happened two weeks back. And as we have seen, a lot of the places, other places also we are seeing, the curve rising, therefore we seem to have a, not exactly a lo localized phenomena, but a relatively larger phenomena. So switching tack midway and trying to rush things here and there, it's better probably to, to expand vaccination in, in total rather than try and switch vaccines. Now that brings me to the next point. You know, India has a number of companies which have capacity to make vaccines and Apart from AstraZeneca, there are at least another six to eight companies who do deliver bulk vaccines. They, in fact, India, I think, produces 60% of all vaccines in the world. And we know that there are, for instance, uh, other tie-ups, not just uh, Serum Institute and Novavax, which is uh, there for the, I think it's called the Covavax vaccine. It's Covavax vaccine. Covavax. And then you also have the Johnson Johnson, the single dose vaccine, which there is a tie up with biological E. So you also have uh, uh, Zydus Cadilla, which is vaccine in the offing. We also have uh, Dr. Reddy's laboratory, which is tied up with uh, Gamalia Sputnik V vaccine. You also have Hetero, which also is, uh, is produce, going to produce a large amounts of vaccine. I think there's another company which has also now thrown its hat with the Sputnik V vaccine. Almost half a billion doses of Sputnik V vaccine alone are uh, seem to be in the pipeline if government of India uh, allows Kamalia Sputnik V vaccine to be actually given clearance. So also the Johnson Johnson vaccine. What is happening to this clearances? Because that could really bring an additionality into the vaccine market. So um, one doesn't know what the CDSCO, the uh, regulatory authority is seeing as data and what they are thinking. The general pattern is the following. As far as vaccines with international tie-ups that are being manufactured and being presented in India uh, for regulatory clearance are concerned, what they need to show, so far as we understand this, to the regulatory authority is a phase one testing in India, which shows that the vaccine is safe, and a phase two testing in India, which shows that the vaccine generates an immune response, generates antibodies in respectable amounts, the same as it does elsewhere. If this evidence is provided from within India, then along with protection data from outside India, the regulatory authority appears to be willing to provide emergency use authorization. And uh, the general um, rumor is that many of these vaccines that you named are waiting to get this set of data together, evidence together, to submit. And that when they've been turned down, they've been turned down because of lack of one or the other of these, these what are being referred to as bridging data, although. So means. essentially more urgent action from both the government authorities, the regulatory authorities, in conjunction with the companies which are supplying the data, because Ultimately, these are not large number of people's trials that you are doing for phase one and phase two. The numbers are quite small. It's actually possible to get it in a month and month and a half. And that's, that's why I'm surprised. We are all surprised why it is taking so long, considering that we are now in the grip of another uh, seems to be outbreak which is going to, which India is already almost the highest number of new cases in the world. We are competing with Brazil, which is not a good distinction to have at the moment. 
So that's not a good sign for us. So more urgent steps to be taken by the government, perhaps in conjunction with the authority, uh, with the companies which are promoting these uh, vaccines. That is at least a takeaway we can have from this discussion. But last question to you. No, this is not something which is restricted to India alone. At the moment, we are seeing uh, free for all uh, in terms of vaccine competition, Europe, European Union threatening UK for not supplying vaccine back to it from UK production centers when they have supplied 10 million doses to European, uh, to uh, UK. Europe uh, is not getting vaccine supply of AstraZeneca. Some they're getting from the United States of the Moderna Pfizer vaccine. Pfizer vaccine was originally a German vaccine, but even given that, they seem to have done pretty badly in uh, how they're handling the supplies of vaccine. And it's clear now that large parts of Europe, particularly those inside as well as outside European Union, are now tying up the Chinese and the Russian vaccines for their citizens. And Serbia is a classic example where they seem to have had a very good run for their money in terms of vaccinating the people. And Germany, France, Italy looking pretty bad on that count. This brings me to the last question that I have of you. You know, European Union has enormous vaccine capacity. Sanofi, uh, Merck, they all have uh, in-house I mean, not in-house, but in country capacity, in Europe, European Union capacity to produce vaccines. We have idle capacity of the vaccines, which is almost as much as supplying the uh, vaccines which are currently in the market. Now, this has been one of the issues, and this has now been focused by even New York Times, that the global leaders, and this is really Europe and the United States, who are there funding these vaccine makers and the option to make this really available to the world. Instead of that, trying to reserve it for their population, they have neither got vaccines for themselves, except the United States, neither have, has the rest of the world got the vaccines it needs. And this is something which the IMF as well as other agencies have said, this is a global epidemic. If we don't stop it in the globe, the economies are not going to re re recover. And this is something which is going to affect the developed countries, rich countries, as much as the poor countries, even if the developed countries get rid of the pandemic from their shores. Do you think this is a classic example of trying to make profits for the big pharma, as we call it, uh, actually ending up by harming themselves? They have shot themselves in the foot. And of course, denying vaccines to the rest of the world. Well, absolutely, except that I would extend your argument not simply to big pharma, but to the basic model of market-based capitalist delivery of solutions to infrastructure needs. COVID-19 pa pandemic responses demand vaccine supplies as an infrastructure need. There is no escaping that. To begin to delude yourselves, as we have for the past year, that the market-based profit competing system of supply can adequately and equitably fulfill an infrastructure need globally was always a Mungeri Lal ka sapna. And that's coming home to roost. Ultimately, public health means what used to be called by, it was called by Ronald Reagan, the dreaded socialized medicine. It's kind of the commie version of public health, according <laughs> to the American right. This is a huge campaign in the 60s, if you remember, with the Ronald Reagan as the face of it at that point of time. He was not the president. He was just the film actors, guild chairman or some president or something. But that is still the specter that haunts a lot of these countries that socialized medicine is something which is equivalent to socialism. And their ideology is private profits will always be more efficient. Markets will always be better than what you call infrastructure needs. Thank you, Satyajit, for being with us, explaining to us not only the science of what is happening, the, but also the larger framing, the framework within which this is happening. This is all the time we have with our viewers today. Thank you very much for watching News Clip and do visit our website as well.